Welcome all and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Michael Downey and it's great to be on board for another AWRI webinar. This week's session was organised late last week as part of the AWRI's response to recent fire, fire events affecting many wine grape growing regions. But before we jump into today's topic, some quick reminders for the audience. Um, to ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send it through. Um, also a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available to view later this afternoon. All registrants will receive a link to view the recording. Uh, for those of you that have just joined us, welcome. Today's AWRI webinar takes a look at assessing and managing fire damaged grapevines. And it's a pleasure to welcome today's speaker. Dr. Marty Longbottom is a senior viticulturist here at the AWRI and brings more than 20 years of national and international experience in vineyard management, technical viticulture, research, education, and extension. Uh, just a reminder, this session is not specifically about smoke taint. Um, however, we do also have Matt Holdstock, part of the AWRI's help desk team in the room today to address any questions regarding smoke taint but they will be addressed at the end of the session. Marty, it's great to have you back for another webinar. So let's jump in and get started. Thank you, Michael. Thanks everyone for joining us this morning. The webinar this morning is aimed at vineyard managers and viticulturists uh, who've had vineyards affected by fire. The aim is to give those people a place to start when assessing vineyards and covers the impacts of fire on grapevines. I've also included some slides showing work done in the Pyrenees region of Victoria after the fires in December 2014, and I'll provide some recommendations for action at the end. Uh, in saying this, I recognise that there's an enormous amount of variability between regions, vineyards and within vineyards, um, and vineyards will recover. The, the actual recovery process is complex and will vary depending on variety, rootstocks, soil moisture status and the intensity of the fire and the heat experienced by grapevines. Each business needs to properly assess their blocks and the damage and make decisions that are right for each individual block and for their business. Um, depending on the timing of fire, remaining fruit may be affected by smoke. If you need specific information about smoke affected fruit, there are resources um, available on the AWR website. Uh, there's a link. Oh, here we go. There's a link there on the page. Um, or you can contact the, the AWR help desk directly. And as Michael said earlier, uh, we have Matt Holstock here in the room and who can answer questions about smoke at the end of the session. The focus, however, is primarily on recovery of vineyards from fire. For those affected by fire, probably the most difficult decision to make is where to start. It's really important that if you have blocks that have a mix of affected and unaffected vines, uh, like shown in this photo here, that you give the affected vines the best chance of survival and those that are unaffected to get them through the rest of the season. So most importantly, um, to reinstate the irrigation as soon as possible and continue your usual spray grow program to get those vines to the end of the season. Fire doesn't affect vines uniformly, and you'll notice vines um, differently affected depending whether they're in the direct path of the fire or if they're affected due to ember attack. Uh, the photo you can see here on the screen shows a burnt vine in an otherwise unaffected vineyard. Um, fuel under the vines was ignited, and not only has this vine been scorched, but the irrigation was also um, melted, the irrigation line. So make sure you're on the lookout for this kind of thing if fires were close to your vineyard. If vines have not been significantly affected by fire, with just some of the leaves scorched, over the coming weeks, the affected leaves will drop off and there may not be enough leaves left there to support the ripening fruit. Now, in these situations, you might consider removing fruit. If you do remove the fruit, this is gonna help the recovering vines by ensuring that vine energy and resources are directed to reserves for the following year. As I mentioned earlier, in December 2014, fires affected vineyards in the Pyrenees region of Victoria. And in the next few slides, I'll show you some of the work they did to understand the impacts and to help them make decisions going forward with their vineyards recovery. 
One of the first things many people try to do is understand the extent to which vineyards and their blocks have been affected. Uh, so after this fire in the Pyrenees, um, which happened in early December, so not at a dissimilar stage to um, the vineyards that have experienced fire this, this season, the vineyard manager used a simple visual assessment key. And what they did was they gave each category a name and a color. They went through the vineyard about 10 days after the fire and scored each vine and recording the results in an Excel spreadsheet. So the categories he used were severe, moderate, slight and alive that you can see here on the screen. And just to give you a little bit more detail, uh, starting with the severely affected vines, and these were given the color red. These vines suffered complete defoliation. They were either on fire or adjacent to extreme radiant heat loads, sufficient to cause critical tissue damage. So again, the color that these ones were given was red. In the moderate category, so given that uh, pale orange color, some of the vines, the vines in this category still had some leaves, but the vines themselves had been exposed to a degree of radiant heat sufficient to cause damage to tissue. And again, they were given that uh, pale orange color. And the next category was the slightly damaged vines. These had minimal damage. The vines showed mild heat stress from fire radiance, but the majority of the leaves were still present and these vines were given the color yellow. The final category were the alive vines. These vines were unaffected by the fire and the green color was used. So using these categories, each fine score was entered into an Excel spreadsheet and the entire block was mapped. In the map you can see on the screen there, the rows are horizontal and you can also see the damaged infrastructure was also recorded in blue. What you can see in the map is the distribution and also the variability of the damage across the block. The next step was to do this for other blocks in the vineyard and overlay this onto a vineyard map. Uh, you can also see the point of origin there of the fire close to the center of the screen where my mouse is hovering over. Um, and a few of the other observations that they were able to make at this time was that uh, really relating to the intensity of the fire and the damage that they could see across these blocks. And this was related to the amount of fuel that was on the um, floor of the vineyard at the time. So things um, like mulch, and this is either straw mulch that would have been applied or mulch that was just there from um, thrown slashings under the vines and old prunings. And this is certainly something that I've seen in the last few days walking around some of the affected vineyards um, close to Adelaide. The other one um, that's been noted in this vineyard and in other previously um, affected vineyards is that the intensity of the fire is much greater along tree lines along the vineyard. In these areas, it's been recorded that the temperatures can get between 1,000 and 2,000 degrees and any vines in close proximity to that were severely affected. Using the visual categories, the vineyard manager was also able to quantify the extent of the damage, which can be useful in thinking about the next steps of rejuvenating the vineyard, but also for having preliminary conversations with great purchasers or insurers. And in this example, at that early assessment date, just 10 days after the fire itself, you can see there that 60% of the vines were considered moderate to extremely damaged. Having observed um, these recovering vines over a number of weeks, some ground truthing of the initial assessment was necessary. Um, so approximately eight weeks after the fire, the vineyard was assessed again using that same method. So you can see up the top there, that was the original assessment that was done. And then they went back through eight weeks later. What you can see in this second assessment is that there's a new color category or a new, uh, yeah, the, the black color there that's appearing that wasn't there in the first one. These black um, vines were considered at that time to be dead. So in the first assessment, 10 days afterwards, there were no, no vines that they were considered dead. There were still signs of life, but certainly after eight weeks, there were some dead vines. You can also see a bit of a change in the um, color distribution across the blocks, especially in the um, yellow and orange colors. So that's that slight to moderately affected vines. So based on that map data, they were able to quantify the change in the categories over time. And starting with this new category that I mentioned, the, the dead one, you can see the numbers there. In the first assessment, they, they were zero. But in that second assessment, eight weeks later, you can see that 8% of those vines were considered dead. 
The next category, the severe category, there was no change in the number, but there was a bit of a change in the distribution of where those severe vines, um, severely damaged vines were. And then when you move to the moderately affected vines, you can see the first um, assessment, there were 40% that were considered moderately damaged, but in the second assessment, only 17% were considered moderately damaged. When you move to the slightly affected category, in the first assessment, 15% were considered slightly damaged, and the second assessment, this had almost doubled to 29%. So there was an increase in this slight category and then the alive category was the same. So there's a couple of things, conclusions we can draw from this. Firstly, that I think we can be fairly confident in the extreme ends of this uh, assessment. So the, the dead and severe, you can be fairly confident in your assessments of those over time and also in the alive category, but in the moderate and slight, there's a fair bit of variation in, the, in that eight week period. But I think the overall, the major benefit of that is just having, having that um, data to be able to quantify the impact on the vineyard. You can see here using that same assessment, you can say that 37% that, uh, was in that severe or extreme and then adding on another 8% of the dead vines. Um, but it, it did enable them to make a lot more informed decisions moving forward. In the Pyrenees situation, um, some of those vines started to recover within around two weeks to um, however, a heat wave in early January saw the vines wilt and that new growth was lost. Um, it is possible to see early recovery that might be short lived. Um, and I'll talk about the cause of this in a moment. Again, in the Pyrenees, this photo shows one of the affected blocks at the end of the season. Uh, what you can see here is a mix of dead, partially alive and also some healthy vines. The decision they face at this point was what to do next. Would all these vines survive and thrive? Would uh, these vines be forever compromised? What they found was that um, those vines that had partially regrown were compromised because they had restricted vascular systems and they were unlikely to ever grow and yield as they previously had. And they also had concerns that, them, that these um, vines with damage might be more vulnerable to trunk diseases and other pathogenic attack. There were also questions around the long-term resilience of these vines to extreme heat and uh, water stress. So the questions for um, owners of vineyards that do have fire affected vines at this point might be, well, do I cut my losses and start again? Or what level of variability and uncertainty am I prepared to accept in the vineyard if I retrain these vines and continue with the vines that are there? When thinking about what's happening with these damaged vines, it's really useful to go back and have a look at the organs being affected by fire damage. The plumbing of grapevines, um, as we know, is essentially made up of two sets of pipes. You've got the xylem, which transports water and nutrients from the roots up into the developing grapes and also the leaves. And then there's also the phloem. So the phloem carries the sugars and nutrients both up and down the vines. And what we're seeing with fire and heat damage is a restriction in the flow of these vessels. And that restriction mostly happens at the base of the vines, but really depending on where the fire has affected these vines. If we ever look at a cross section of a grapevine shoot, the vascular bundle or the plumbing looks like this. So this is a young shoot and doesn't necessarily show exactly what would be seen inside a mature trunk. Um, but what you can see is the phloem is just there underneath the bark and the xylem or the water carrying vessels are further below the surface. So what this means is that damage close to the surface, surface will affect the phloem and then damage that goes deeper will affect the xylem. So with shallow damage, you, um, you may still see and feel some water flow in those affected vines but these vines might be severely compromised and deteriorate over weeks and months. The other important set of cells there uh, that sits between the xylem and phloem is the cambium layer. And now these cells are the regenerative cells that develop into new phloem and xylem. If these cells are damaged or if they die, the vascular system can't regrow and this damage is permanent. Now, what this looks like in fire damaged vines um, is shown here in the photograph. This vine has had a shallow cut taken from the trunk to expose the tissue underneath the bark. And if we take a closer look at this, um, and I'll show you, this yellow circle shows roughly where the cambium layer is. You can see 
the presence of green tissue is a good indicator of living tissue and the potential for renewal in that section of the trunk. However, you can also see some brown tissue here um, and this is the dead tissue and no renewal is gonna happen in this, this area. Now it's really important to evaluate how much of the tissue is compromised when you're assessing the future viability of these vines. Now this can be really difficult because the leaves might still appear green and there's evidence of sap flow or water flow in the trunk and you can actually see here that this vine, while it is affected, the glistening here shows that there is some sap flow occurring. But it really depends how deep the damage is and how far around the trunk the damage extends. Um, the effect of um, a lot of damage around the trunk is similar to ring barking or girdling. And if you see this around more than around about 60% of the trunk, the vine is likely to be severely compromised and it may die over time. Uh, on a different vine, you can see where a similar patch of bark is removed. Um, the tissue is brown, uh, indicating that it is dead. One of the big risks of retaining vines of damage to their vascular system is the risk of a slow starvation due to ring barking. If vines have had a significant portion of the phloem damaged and where this may have extended more deeply past the cambium um, into the xylem, these vines might appear healthy now, but they may decline over time. So ring barking is essentially a slow starvation of vines. It can happen um, really quickly in a number of days, or it can happen more slowly over weeks or even years. And what you might be seeing now, as I said before, is that the xylem is still function. Water is being transported to the leaves and fruit, and the leaves are functioning and the fruit is developing. But if the carbohydrates that are being um, generated through, through photosynthesis are prevented from going back down into the phloem or via the phloem back down to the roots, um, the vines over time will start to decline and die because they're not being replenished. It's really important to, to consider this when assessing the viability of a vineyard after fire exposure. In young vines with thinner trunks, the damage um, may be much more severe. These photos here were taken just last week, uh, about 10 days after the fire, and you can see that there's quite significant browning of not just the cambium and the upper layers there, but quite deep into the trunks. In older vines with thicker trunks, the damage might be more variable. Um, it's still possible for the trunks to have viable tissue on one side and be burnt on the another, on another side, depending on the direction of travel of the fire. You can see here in the background, there's some um, burnt stubble on the ground, but on this side here, there's not so much burning and the tissue here may be okay. And on the other side, it could be completely dead. Uh, if they are indeed alive, these vines are they will have lower capacity to grow and produce grapes. Um, having said this, it might also be possible for these vines to reshoot from the roots and underground sections of the trunk. This will really depend on the intensity of the heat experienced at depth in the soil and also on the soil moisture that was uh, available when the fire came through and also post the fire itself. Uh, looking a little bit higher up in the vine, this photo shows damage to a cordon that was exposed to fire. You can see the difference between the healthy green vascular tissue at the top and the damaged brown tissue on the underside of the cordon. In this case, the cane that came from uh, the cordon would probably have reduced capacity and you might see weak shoots with low fruiting capacity next year. Um, looking forward to vine recovery. These photos were taken in the Pyrenees vineyards uh, in 2015. The picture on the left was taken two to three weeks after the fire, and you can see the buds starting to push out at the base of the shoots. And the photo on the right was taken towards the end of the growing season, and you can see that some of the vines have shoots that have, that have uh, reshot from the base of the vines. If you do get to the end of the season and you can see evidence of vine recovery, that is you've got healthy shoots, they've regrown from the base and they have um, healthy tissue, the chances of retraining these shoots to form a new trunk and new cordons are very high. Um, alternatively, if most of the vines are healthy and you only need to fill in gaps, it might also be possible to use layering to fill those gaps in. So just in summary, it, most important is 
that irrigation is critical and if you've got damage to irrigation or no irrigation at all, if you can re-establish that as quickly as possible, that will be really important to the recovery of these vines. If you have um, some vines that have been only slightly affected, it may be um, worthy considering taking the fruit from those vines to make sure that they do recover well. And also it's possible that you might get early signs of recovery, but then that those vines might collapse after those early signs of recovery. Um, damage to vines and death of vines is really variable from vine to vine within the same vineyard and it really depends on how much heat they were exposed to. So thinking about those critical areas along tree lines which are going to be exposed to much greater intensity of heat, they will be um, more severely damaged than those that had less uh, exposure. When you are doing assessments, the vines change over time. So if you're going out to do those early assessments that you should expect that the vines will change over time. If you want to do a final assessment, I'd say delay it at least eight weeks and if possible, perhaps even wait to the end of the season and see what's regrown from those um, trunks of the vines. But if you can quantify the, the, um, the effects that fire has had, it will assist you with your decision making um, if you go through that process. If you choose to retain the vines um, and not remove them at all and retrain them, it's that can take two to three years to get back to full production. And I think it's really important for, for everyone affected by these fires and with damaged vines that you really need to evaluate the cost and the effort to rejuvenate a mix of dead and unhealthy vines against total replant. So weigh up the benefits of having a uniform vineyard and one that's um, got a very, lot of variability. So just lastly, if you wanted to get hold of some more resources, um, there's an information pack on the AWRI website. The link's there on the screen now. There's a number of different publications that you can get access to. And by going to that link and clicking on those boxes, providing your details, you can put a request through to the AWRI library. Um, just lastly, I'd like to thank um, the One Australia for the funds that go towards supporting the um, AWRI help desk. These funds come from growers, grower and winemaker levies. And also just to remind you that the AWI help desk is available to provide technical support. It's a free and confidential service for all levy payers. Um, you can contact us um, by email or at the phone number there and also go to our website for more resources. So thank you very much. And handing back to Michael for the Q&A session. Thanks very much, Marty. Um, really important topic and Marty's going to stick around now for any questions you may have. Um, just a reminder to the audience, if you do want to ask a question, open the Q&A button on your webinar toolbar, type in your question and click to send it through. Um, as I mentioned at the start, we will be prioritising questions relating to fire damage vines, but if there are any smoke tank questions that come through, we also have Matt Holdstock in the room who um, is available to address those questions. I'm going to let Marty coordinate and moderate the Q&A. So Marty, I'll hand it over to you to get started. There's a question um, here asking around the impact of rootstocks. So just let me read it. Uh, yeah, the question is around um, whether or not there's rootstocks in the vineyard and the opportunity for redevelopment of those as opposed to just waiting for the vines to shoot. Obviously the pictures I've shown there and I was talking more generally about vines that are grown on their own roots. Um, obviously it's much easier to train those up and redevelop. If you are growing vines on rootstocks, it will be more difficult um, depending on where the shoots come from. Obviously, if they're suckering from the rootstock, you may, there's a potential to regraft back onto the rootstock. Um, it really depends on the situation, but obviously the situation is different with rootstocks. Question here, should you cut vines off at ground level immediately after fire to reduce ring bark risk to get early sucker shoots? Um, generally what we're saying is don't rush into cutting anything off straight away. 
um, it's really important to understand what proportion of the vineyard are so severely affected that you'd want to cut them all off. Um, I think it's a, it's a vineyard to vineyard choice if you are very, very confident that all of your vineyard has been affected and the trunks have got that damage to the vascular tissue, then you could go in and cut them all off and then, then give yourself more opportunity for those suckers to grow. Um, but I'd say in more generally, just wait and make sure you're very, very confident that they are all that severely damaged that you'd want to cut them off. There's a few smoke tank questions here, but I'll just hold them over for a minute. Um, there's uh, good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, there's a couple of questions here on smoke tank. One is, is there any evidence of smoke tank carrying over into the next season? Um, the work that we've done at the Adderai has not seen any evidence of that. So the answer to that would be no at this point that we're aware of. There's another question asking, are there plans to hold a, a specific session on analysis of fruit juice, potential smoke taint and update on any new technologies, ideas to remove the smoke taint? Look, um, I'm not sure which region that question's come from, but currently we've got um, colleagues on the ground in different regions around Australia doing Q&A type questions. Um, so look, stay tuned. We'll try and advertise that through the local associations where we're going to be. I know there's a Q&A session happening in Mudgee today, I believe. Um, there was a couple in New South Wales yesterday as well. Um, and there's one in northeast Victoria next week. Um, I'll try and find that information exactly where that is shortly. Um, so, yeah, so yes, there will be um, further sessions available. Um, specific questions like that. If you've got any really specific questions, I encourage you to use the Adderbury Help Desk email. Um, someone will get back to you within hopefully 24 hours on that. Um, but yeah, there is work that's been done here at Adderbright on technologies and reduction techniques. Look, nothing is um, uh, solid and there's nothing that we can provide at this stage that is the absolute panacea that will remove everything. Um, but we can give you some ideas to try and reduce it if it's in that borderline category. There was another um, two questions that were prior to the webinar, pre-webinar questions. One was including um, what sprays, including water, could be used to mitigate the effect of smoke taint. Um, as far as we've seen in previous seasons, washing grapes with um, water didn't help. Um, so that's not necessarily a, uh, an option that's going to be effective. The other one was, can a spray be applied to prevent taint penetration into grapes? Look, there has been a little bit of work done on that here in the last past 12 to 18 months, but none of the sprays that we've evaluated here appear to reduce the uptake of volatile phenols into the fruit. Um, and the formation of glycosides in grapes. So um, there's nothing that we can provide here or give you um, an answer to that will mitigate that at this stage. Uh, there's a question here around VSP trained vines. And the question is, rather than cutting the trunk, could you cut the cordon back to the head and force latent buds to burst at the head of the vine? Um, I'd say that's certainly an option, but you'd want to rule out the possibility of damage down on the trunks. So I'm guessing here you're talking about if you feel like you've just got damage to the cordon and not the trunk. Um, yeah, it's really important that you do understand whether or not there's damage down on the trunk. And if there is damage down there, you'd need to cut below the damage. don't currently have any further questions. Uh, Marty and Matt will stick around for a little while longer. So if you do have any final questions, this is your chance. Please start sending them through. Okay, there's, there's another question regarding um, Verizon and whether this lessens the risk of smoke taint. Um, this is a little bit more complex. Um, yes, it does reduce the risk of smoke taint uptake um, prior to Verizon, uh, but we have seen uh, vineyards that have had bushfires or fires very close to it 
be affected at very early development stage in the pea size stage. So yes, it is less uh, chance of um, uptake, but it can happen if the fire is quite close and the, and the, and the smoke is quite fresh. So it doesn't necessarily make it, doesn't rule it out, but it, um, it is possible still. Uh, there's a question here, would leaving partially damaged vines increase the pres pressure to disease or rot? Look, the answer is it is possible, yes. Uh, any dead or dying tissue can be susceptible to yeah, secondary invaders. So it is, it's probably not a great thing. And if you can get rid of them down the track, it would be advisable. Uh, I've got another question here. If we cut the trunk, when will be the latest to do it, to have good lignica lignification for the new shoots? Uh, it's a good question. Um, look, what we're saying really is if you can delay that assessment, the later you leave it, the better indication you'll have of whether or not those vines themselves will reshoot and regrow. Um, if the damages happen now, you've got you know the next couple of months to evaluate whether or not they're going to come back. Um, and it may be that you don't keep much at all of what comes back this season, that it gets pruned back in wintertime this year. And, but you'll have confidence that the vines will grow back the following year. Um, look, it, it would be a risky thing to go out now and make the evaluation that you're going to cut everything off now, let everything reshoot and use the trunks that grow this year. However, having said that, it is possible and people have been known to do it in, in other years after they've experienced fire damage. So it's, it's not out of the realms of possibility. But you would need to have at least, at least probably six weeks of growth to get that lignification. Uh, there's a question here, are there any non-destructive ways to evaluate cambium layer viability? Look, I'm not aware of any other way. There are a number of other ways you can look at the cambium layer and whether or not it's viable that you can use a different uh, staining method but they're all destructive so yeah no I, I don't know that there's any other ways of doing that uh, there's a question here is there an increased risk of botrytis with fruit retained to ripen i think the question you're asking is if there's fruit there now, the vines have been affected and are they at increased risk of botrytis later in the season? I would say that probably the only way they could be at increased risk of botrytis is if they are past veraison and if there's also damage to those berries. Just um, the work that I referred to in the Pyrenees in uh, Victoria, just to let you know that that work was done, a lot of it that was done was done by Matt Bailey, who was working in the vineyard there at the time. And uh, I'm not sure where Matt's located now, but I'm sure if people wanted to reach out to him to get more information about that, that he would be available. Okay, Marty, looks like that may well be it with regard to the Q&A side of things. Did you want to make any final comments before we finish the session? No, just a bit of a reminder that if you are looking for um, specific technical support, you can contact the help desk. Um, there's a few viticulturists there. Um, we are organising, as Matt said before, some regional sessions too, and we can certainly put on more of these webinars if it's needed. There's just another question that's come through. Is there a benefit adding liquid fertilizer to irrigation water at this time to stimulate root growth? Oh, that is a tricky one. <clears throat> um, if we just go back to thinking about um, the best timing of fertilizers, the liquid fertilizers, the best time to put them on is when the root activity is stimulated. Now, root, there wouldn't have been, if the fire's happening now, there probably wouldn't have been a lot of root activity going on at this time. However, the stimulation from the fire, and especially if you cut those vines off, it, it's possible that it will stimulate root activity. I don't know the absolute answer on that, but I'd say um, 
at a bare minimum, just make sure you've got the irrigation on. It's especially if you I'm thinking this through, if you've cut off trunks and cut off a significant part of the vine, um, it's probably not really necessary to put any fertilizer on. Those vines are going to be they've got a fair bit of capacity in the roots and also in the um, storage tissue. So they for that initial lot of growth, they probably don't need any fertilizer. I'd, I'd save the fertilizer for later on. Okay, I think we'll leave it there, Marty. Thank you for taking the time to communicate some really key and important messages around this topic and also for answering many questions that have come through. Um, as has been emphasised a couple of times already, I do encourage you to contact the AWRI help desk if you have any further queries around this topic. Um, I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for taking the time to participate in today's session. Um, the next AWRI webinar is on the 23rd of January. Dr. Eric Wilkes from the AWRI will take a look at measuring BOME and BRICS and understanding their relationship with final alcohol concentration. Uh, thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar. <laughs>